So I'd like to invite or uh, introduce um, my co-editor, Jonathan, to give his perspective as my, co as my co-editor. He is a young, education, uh, a young educator from the National University of Singapore. He is now working with the NUS Teaching Academy to explore the impact of AI on higher education and to propose educational policies on how the university can embrace it in a way that will enable, will enable not just students for, to be future ready, but also for educators and academics to remain ready for purpose in the future. Jonathan. Thank you, Jan. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Jonathan Sim. I'm a lecturer of philosophy at the National University of Singapore. Uh, I teach the philosophy of computing and data analysis. Uh, so we deal with the ethics of algorithms, the ethics of models, right? I also teach classical Chinese philosophy. So two very different things, but somehow it's all in from the one person, right? Um, now, sorry, can I just go? I, I want to comment, well, there are many, many learning points from, from this book, and it has been a real honor and privilege for me to be a co-editor, right? There, there's one lesson uh, out of many lessons that I wish to highlight from this book, which is, the success of universities in the past can also be the stumbling blocks for universities in the future. And when this book came out, um, it, it, it first published that some, sometime in November, right? Uh, we didn't expect AI, chat GPT to come out, right? And so it, it's very, very fitting that this book came out uh, around the same time as uh, the, the, the chatbot. Now, uh, it's very easy for us to talk about the future or the futures of universities in a very general and abstract way. But in many ways, I believe that the future is here. Uh, what, what do I mean? Because you see, uh, just a show of hands, how many of you have actually played with uh, ChatGPT? Okay, so for those of you who have not, okay, ChatGPT is one of many more artificial intelligence that we're going to uh, see, right? Um, it can write essays. I can take an MCQ multiple choice question. I can feed it in. It can answer. It can tell me which option is the correct option. Okay. I can write, get it to generate programming code. I can even feed it buggy programming code and ask it to fix it for me. Right. I can get it to write essays. I can get it to write plays. I can get it to write poems. Now, in Singapore, there are many people who are using it in industries now. They're writing emails with ChatGPT. Right, uh, the, some of the marketing texts are, are also being written uh, by ChatGPT. Uh, Ryan Reynolds did a car advertisement, and he also used ChatGPT to do the the text. Right, so it's becoming more and more mainstream. And why is this a, a relevant question? You know, the future is here. Is because more and more students are going to go for internships. They're going to go into industries, and they're going to see that the people at work are going to use AI. Right, and they're going to say. Why am I at university? Why am I paying all these school fees when all I just need to know is how to play with ChatGPT? As an educator, I realize I'm also at existential risk. Why? Because now if you go online, many students are saying, hey, ChatGPT can teach better than my teacher. And, they're more, and the AI is more patient, you know, right? If you don't understand, you can still say, I don't understand, and the AI can respond. And this is only version three. Version four is coming out this, later this year, and there's going to be version five, version six, right? And we can, uh, and, and, and one of the chief uh, AI scientists from UNSW has said that in the forthcoming versions, you can train it to speak in your own voice. Right now, if you play with ChatGPT for one hour, you're going to see that there's a very consistent writing style. Of course, you can say, oh, can you write it in the style of, uh, let's say, Dr. Mahathir? It can, it can do that, right? You can, uh, it, it can learn and it can write in the style of Lee Kuan Yew as well, right? So you, we can do that. But in the future, it can learn from us and write in our own style. What does this mean for us as educators? What does it mean for us at work, right? Now, so there is a huge existential risk, okay? And at the National University of Singapore, um, I, I am right now working to research ways for us to add value because yeah, like I said, students are going to say, if I can do all these things with AI, I don't need to come to university. So then what is my value as an educator? What is our value as a university so that students will say, I still want to come, I still want to get my degree. Yeah? 
And it's very, uh, of course, it's worrying. And, and one of the things that, that I want us to, to recognize is that it's not just a cheating tool. Because one, one of the scary things is that when we frame it as a cheating tool, it becomes framed as this taboo subject. Don't talk about it. Let's not touch it. In Australia right now, right? Uh, if you've been following the news, Australia, New York, all the universities have stopped continuous assessments. They've gone to closed book final exams, right? How drastic is that? Now, just think about it. We say, okay, all this AI is going to replace deep thinking, deep learning. But if we're so afraid of cheating that we go back to closed book final exams, then we're not giving students a chance to go further in their thinking, right? If we want students to think deeply, we can't give them two, three hours. We can't make them cram for a final exam, right? So, and one more thing also, it, this AI, uh, ChatGPT is one of many, right? It's going to be here to stay. The CEO of Microsoft already said, uh, Microsoft has uh, made a deal, right? It's going to be in the productivity tools. You're going to see ChatGPT in Microsoft Word, Microsoft Outlook, PowerPoint and everything, right? So it's going to be here to stay. So we as educators, we need to figure out how we can embrace artificial intelligence in our teaching so that students can see the added value. That is the key, right? And of course, like I said just now, the things that have made, <clears throat> the things that have made universities successful are also the stumbling blocks for how we engage with the future. Now, let me explore two possibilities with which uh, we can embrace AI, just so you know how big the revolution may be, right? The first is this, okay? We can get the AI to generate an essay, right? Um, by my standards, I would give it a B, very rarely a B plus, right? So there is still room for improvement, right? So we get the students to generate an essay and then we say, okay, we will grade you based on how you edit this essay. Maybe you turn on uh, track changes in Microsoft Word lah, so you can see the changes. Now, you notice that the learning objectives have changed. We are not teaching students how to write essays anymore. We're teaching them how to edit essays, right? So one way in which we embrace AI is that all, many, or in fact, most or all of our learning objectives will shift. And when these learning objective shifts, what happens? All our learning activities will change. Ah. So what's the problem? How many educators are willing to embrace this kind of change? It's a lot of work. I mean, I design one course. I, I teach like five, 600 students every semester. I have weekly assignments. I have changed every assignment. How many uh, educators are willing to do that, right? So that's one. Now, Another way in which we can embrace AI is we say, okay, let's move away from grades. Because if, let's say, AI can do everything in the future, can do everything that we do very well in terms of content generation, okay, then maybe we need to play up other areas, like, you know, building up their portfolio. Yeah? Uh, they may not be good at study, or they may be good at study, but we want them to be good at something else. Um, teamwork, leadership, and stuff like that, right? Again, what, what is the problem that we will face? Many educators are going to say, this is not my job scope. This is not my KPI. Why should I care? Right? So, I, and I already as a young educator, uh, sometimes I talk to people, I say, you know, I, be I believe education should be this. Some educators, right? Some faculty, uh, they, they will say, no, why are you doing this? This is not your job. Right? So we need to be, we do need to have this question. And of course, maybe to help frame our discussions of AI uh, is we, we tend to think of AI purely in terms of uh, like replacement because it's efficient, it's going to replace. But let me offer you two more categories. Rather than, than replacement, substitution, why not think of it as augmentation? How can AI augment us, assist us? Yeah? How can it add value to us just as how we can add value to the work that AI does? Another category for thinking about it is rather than in terms of efficiency, what about human flourishing? How can AI lead us towards greater human flourishing? If, for example, like I say, we, we learn to write better because of uh, using a, the AI as, say, as a base, right? It, they, these kinds of exercises are pushing us to think further, think deeply, right? So maybe this is the thing that, 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 that we, should, we should consider, yeah? Uh, augmentation rather than substitution, human flourishing rather than efficiency. Well, okay, that is all. Say, um, yeah, some food for thought. Thank you very much. Uh, no, I, I wanted to, to make some comments in response to, to uh, many of the remarks that were going around the room. Uh, because I, I wear two hats, right? I wear the hat of a philosopher, 
I wear the hat of an educator, right? Uh, and we hear the word ethics and uh, wisdom and humanity being thrown, thrown around uh, quite a lot in the past, uh, in the, uh, just now, right? So two observations about digital transformation. And uh, this is coming from me as an educator. I see 1,000, uh, around 1,000 students every year, right? And many of them in NUS are also from Malaysia. So what I see, I, I think we can extrapolate and say it applies here, right? Uh, we talk about mental, mental health. Why are so many uh, of our students, okay, maybe I stand because I'm, why are so many of our students actually um, having so much anxiety and mental health problems? A lot of it actually has to do with social media, digital transformation, and we're not paying enough attention to it. Because I, I speak to my students and I ask, you know, we, when I was a student, we just say, I stress, I stress, I stress. Now, they use language of fear. They don't say I stress. They say, I'm afraid, I'm anxious, I'm worried, I'm scared. This is the language of our undergraduates now. And I ask, and I've been trying to find out why. And I, what I've come to realize is they've been growing up in, a, in an age of social media. Since they, 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 whenever they can remember, it has always been social media. But one thing that our young people don't understand is that when, when we post on social media, we post what? our idealized versions of ourselves, right? Before, when we were students, you know, if I want to see how my peers are doing, I'll just like check in on you, right? Oh, okay, you're like, you're, you're like that, like that, right? Now, we rely on social media as if it's going to uh, inform us and everyone's just posting their idealized versions of themselves. So imagine, right? I'm a student here. On, I go on Instagram, everyone's here. That's why the stress is incredibly high. Like every time I talk to one of my students, they join LinkedIn, right? And then they see, oh, my peers have uh, five internships. They are in two ex exco committees. They, they have uh, 10 online uh, course uh, certificates. They panic, they panic. And, and I have students writing to me. They say, uh, uh, Miss Mr. Sim, you know, I, I'm so tired. I just want to rest. But everyone is doing everything, you know? So now, linked to digital transformation, right? We say that social media is impacting mental health. But look at what's going on in our uh, public discourse. We are framing this as a technological problem. We're saying, oh, this is the problem of Instagram. The, de the developer should do something about it. We, we, every time a computer is involved, we keep framing it as a technological problem. We don't realize that nowadays, the, the online and offline world are overlapping. So we need to stop talking about it as a computer problem and more as a culture problem. Right, uh, and now with AI and with robotics, um, in the field of philosophy, right, we are starting to realize that a lot of philosophical, ethical questions are fast becoming engineering questions. Engineering questions, right? Like if the car, you know, automated car, so you know, you're just driving down, so suddenly a pedestrian just jumps out, right? Should the car prioritize saving the driver or saving the pedestrian? There and there, that's an engineering question already. So many, and, and because we frame all these technological problems as computer problems, as tech problems, we are relying on the developers to make ethical de uh, decisions for us. And many of them are not trained. How, how many people are doing philosophy, right? Yeah. Now, and, and you know what's the irony? We keep talking about, oh, you know, yes, wisdom, philosophy, very important. But then every time, like, I, I know this because I, I grew up studying philosophy and people say, why do you study philosophy? Can get a job, man. Can eat, man. Right. So we 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 recognize the value of philosophy of ethics, but we discourage our young people from pursuing it every time. I, I always have students say, "I want to learn, but my parents say it's useless. You cannot get a job." So you notice there is this uh, contradiction, right? We say we value humanity, and yet we discourage our children because we say you cannot get a job. So I think we need to 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 really you know ask ourselves. Do we, what do we really value? Yeah, here we keep saying humanity. Then if we say that is the, the case, then we should encourage our young people to pursue ethics, philosophy. Yeah, uh, yeah. so, so this, is, uh, this is me coming from, from the position of a 30-plus-year-old, uh, uh, working with, uh, I, I think I've taught about 7,000 students already. Yeah, yeah seven years, so 7,000 students, right? And, and this is what I've observed. And we are seeing all this as part of the digital transformation. And we cannot see them as separate things. They're all interconnected, one, one with the other. Okay, thank you.